different but I'm switching on to archaeology. So I'm looking here at the potential role of archaeology to the environmental humanities and I'm moving to East Africa just for a slightly different case study. Um, we've kind of touched on it but what is the environmental humanities and here I'm defining it um, in specific ways because these are the ones I'm going to pick up on. The environmental humanities can be understood as a wide-ranging response to environmental challenges of our time. Uh, and the second way is basically putting an emphasis on various approaches um, in environmental scholarship and how we can bring those into conversation with each other. So again, kind of picking up on what I was saying just now. But um, within this as well, um, we have the role of archaeology. Um, we've talked a little bit about paleoecology and how that may sit within it. Um, and again, just the same thing, we've got um, the environmental humanities, we've also got kind of eco-criticism sitting within it. I'm going to focus a little bit more on um, eco-criticism. So, Eco-criticism, for me, really, is about exploring the way that we imagine and portray the relationship between humans and the environment. Uh, and as Ben has outlined, this is um, developed mainly out of literary criticism, but has also increasingly fed through in from, into other media to come into criticism too, whether it's TV, art, um, film, architecture, all sorts. And also the important point is that this relationship is thought to be socially and culturally um, dependent. And this also means that if you're in a different cultural or social, social situation, you can also um, shift and play with this. This is not firm. This is something that can be um, moved around. It's not static. So looking at this whole idea of nature culture divide, which to a certain extent has been discussed a lot, so I'm not going to go into the history of that, but from an eco-critical perspective, if we as a society want people to engage with wider environmental issues, then we need, to pe we need for people to see themselves as part of that environment and not separate from it. And for me, this is potentially where archaeology and paleoecology can start to come into it. So what, what are the environmental challenges of our time? There are ultimately many, but climate change surely has to be one of the, the big ones at the moment. Uh, and more particularly, uh, climate change in East Africa. Here, temperature is expected to rise faster than the rest of the world. Um, it could exceed um, 2 degrees by the mid-21st century and 4 degrees by the end of the 21st century. And bizarrely, it's not really expected to become drier, but it's actually expected to become increasingly wet. So it's this idea that climate change isn't a static thing in itself, that it will have different effects in different places. But what does that have to do with us um, sitting here in Southampton uh, within a very generally Western audience? And really, again, if we want to be concerned, if we want people outside of Africa to be concerned with climate change in Africa, what does that actually mean to us? Now, I'm not going to go in today into the effect <coughs> they will have on livelihoods in Africa because that's a whole other talk, but really, what, is, what does this mean to us today? Effectively, we get a lot of commodities uh, from Eastern Africa, and these include rice, tea, and coffee, things that do very much affect our everyday lives. Rice um, is expected to have a 10% reduction with an in uh, increase in temperature of one degree. Um, tea and coffee, at the moment there's an area of between 60 and 80% that's currently thought to be cultivatable for tea and coffee. Uh, with climate change, well, by 2050, that's expected to reduce to between 20 to 40%. So you can see here that uh, our supply and demand chains are going to be uh, massively affected by this. Uh, but at the moment, there's a mismatch in perception. So if we're looking at um, the cultivation of these crops in these lovely lush environments, um, this isn't necessarily what we would think of as Africa. Um, it's been said that the negative perceptions and representations such as civil wars, hunger, corruption, greed, selfishness, selfishness uh, diseases, poverty and the <coughs> like have been the defining characteristics of Africa and Africans in the minds of many Western people. Uh, and this is perpetuated by the media and this is where the eco-critical perspective is coming in. So we need to find ways to really challenge the attention regime of the news media um, and the demand that it has for this fast-paced drama, clear resolutions, visual spectacles. And this is also perpetuated further by things like the tourist industry, where again we have these lovely images of safaris and uh, beaches. Again, it's very different to that kind of everyday lived agricultural reality. So. How does eco-criticism kind of approach this and suggest that we deal with it? Um, and I've kind of identified, identified three things here. One is they think that it needs to be relatable. People are best equipped to observe what happens around them when they can see, hear, touch, smell the things. So that's why, again, I've picked those things like our cup of tea, our cup of coffee, the rice that we eat, the things that relate to us. 
Um, culturally situated, um, they say it's not helpful to posit climate change as a mega problem awaiting demanding of a mega solution. As I said before, it's not a one-size-fits-all problem and it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Instead, it's entangled with complex human activities, feelings and beliefs. Um, and also it's scalable. The idea of the local is actually quite a, a key thing. We can look at the local and from that we can use that to expand our awareness. So for me, this is where archaeology and paleoecology um, could play a role, mainly focusing on archaeology. I'm going to look at a site that um, we're excavating in Tanzania, northern Tanzania and Garuka. Um, it's one of the largest abandoned irrigated and terrace landscapes in eastern Africa. It dates from uh, AD 1400 to 1800. And the site is consisting of, it's a massive site, it's uh, over a thousand hectares, which I think is like one and a half times the size of Gibraltar, of these field systems. You can see them on the ground today. They just look like pots of stones, um, but they're all irrigated. So there's massive irrigation channels there as well. The, behind the site, which you can't see, is a big escarpment. So on the escarpment, they have, I think, about 1,400 millimetres of rain currently a year, which comes down in rivers. Uh, and on the semi-arid area where the agriculture was, um, there's only about 400 millimetres of rain coming down currently. But yeah, there's these irrigation channels and there's up to two metres of sediment built up and there are these fantastically deep, um, beautiful walls that are constructed for channelling the water. So what you would see on the surface is just a line of stones. When you actually start to dig down into it, um, it it's, a, it's a 3D site like most archaeological sites. Um, but we've been trying to examine how the water has been moving through that site, how people were controlling it, where they were irrigating, where they weren't irrigating, where they were trapping sediments, where they weren't. And we've been doing that through archaeological stratigraphy, soil micromorphology, geochemistry and soil science as well. And this work has been going on since the 1960s, but um, in, there's been various different projects there. And this is kind of where we're up to at the moment. And what we're seeing is that generally that this um, site has seen massively shifting soil and water management practices. It's not been a one-size-fits-all um, by any means. Uh, at some areas we can see it in one profile, we can see that we've got seasonal irrigation, wetting and drying of fields. Then we can see that at some points there were fertilisers um, applied. We can also see that they were managing the soils in a way so as to avoid salinisation, which is a key point of waterlogging. And then also we have these bands of very thin waterlogged soils. Um, we can see in the micromorphology here where we've got um, irrigations of paddy-like um, fields there. We've also got phytoliths from rice as well. So we're, we think at the moment that we were likely to have periods of, of rice cultivation going on. So if you've got rice cultivation going on, <coughs> you've got, again, this kind of difference between a, a perception and a reality. Um, this is the modern village of Engaruka, which sits within the archaeological site, just to give you an idea of scale. And then this is the archaeology around it. So you can just see the difference when you're actually starting to manage water that, that it can make to, to irrigation. Irrigation becomes possible, but not just possible, but actually almost verdantly abundant when you're, when you're working there. So coming back to the UK criticism, so how can we use an example like that? And again, I think there's some bigger ways of just starting to think about how we look at our archaeology and what it's telling us, coming up to some of these kind of bigger messages. And whilst they might, might seem like truisms to us, again, thinking about how we translate those to a different sector, they can be very relevant. So first of all, Engaruka is a very localised example of looking at changing activity to different environmental conditions when, when, or was, when there was or wasn't water coming down. Um, but also relating that back to us, with climate change, we are going to have to adapt as well. It's coming back to that whole kind of scalable thing. People have done it in the past and, and they've managed and, and we will find ways because human nature is to be adaptive and creative. It's also culturally situated. Um, this whole idea that climate change is entangled with um, all sorts of human activity, feelings and beliefs. Well, what does archaeology do? Um, we look at all of those things as well. Um, we're, we are very well placed to start to contribute to some of these ideas. And again, relatable. If we want to um, make things relatable to the public, we can actually, on a very core scale, use archaeology. The public like archaeology. They identify with these, these icons of it, the Indiana Jones, the pyramids. There's something there that will automatically get people's attention. We, we can use that, we can manipulate that. But then also coming back to this idea of a daily lived experience, that's what archaeology does. It shows us how people were living in the past, not the extremes that the media portray um, or that some of the kind of um, extremes of some of the historical documents as well. We're actually starting to see the, the detail of what people were doing. 
Um, and also, just again, this idea of uh, making it relatable. This coming back to this idea of, of, of rice. People were growing rice. We eat rice. It's something that we can identify with. So coming back out again, so that's kind of looking at eco-criticism, but the environmental humanities, one of the main things that, um, it, that the Berthwag article argues is that the environmental humanities research is, needs to be jolted out of disciplinary ruts and mindsets, which should prompt them to reassess the character of their own work and its relationship to the work done by other <coughs> scholars. And really the other point that they make again is that it's about not just crossing into disciplinary boundaries, but also taking this out into the world as well. So... For me, this whole idea of the environmental humanities is actually how we do relate with other disciplines and the public too. And whilst these aren't necessarily the answers, and they may be controversial and you want to kind of um, disagree with some of them, they're there really to kind of as a thought-provoking um, exercise. So I'm going to leave that there. As soon as we overran on the other one, I'll finish short for this one.